so next up is Simo with his talk, Tour of Scientific Computing Skills and Tools. Yes, Hello. let's see if I get the share going on. Yes, are you ready? There you go. So yeah, Simo is one of my colleagues at Alto. He's been here longer than I have and, well, is sort of a wizard yeah. on software and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I can quickly give an introduction. So hi, everybody. Uh, Simo Tuom has already been here for a few talks, but, but mainly, <clears throat> yeah. So as Rich said, I've been here, here in Alto for a long time already. Uh, and I basically, like I, I did my master's in, in uh, physics, computational physics, but I chose this kind of a, this kind of a route instead of going towards like academic route because I felt like this kind of a crafting atmosphere that the scientific computing has is better suited to my skills and, uh, and interests. Uh, but, but at the same time, I completely, uh, well, I'm very interested in what what people are actually using these things for, but mainly there's like yeah I'm I'm more of of this spectrum of I like to do the things, uh, but not necessarily do the writing of the paper and stuff like that. But uh, so but let's start with the talk, uh, and I will want to go through a quick journey of like <clears throat> scientific computing, and what kind of tools are, do you need throughout this way. Uh, so, so the journey for scientific computing is is a winding one, like we had in the previous talk um, or the one after and one before that. Uh, that the like, typical uh, scientific computing workflow might look something like this. So you have some experiment, and then you do some models, and and then you do some raw data, and you have lots of different things that you need to handle throughout your process. So, so it's usually a good idea to to take some best practices or like take some tools that you know are good and reuse those tools because yeah, if you have a bad tools uh, you might reuse them uh, so uh, there's this uh, quote by this uh, this sociolo sociologist i think uh, abraham maslow who said that uh, i suppose it's tempting if uh, if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as it were a nail so basically because you're learning constantly while you're doing, and you're you're doing stuff, and you're learning because, well, you're doing stuff. Uh, you immediately start to learn some tools, and if those tools happen to be the wrong tools, you might end up in a situation where you start using the same hammer for every nail. And in scientific computing, it's usually better to be a bit more flexible with your tools, and uh, and just like go with the flow and use the tools that are good for the situation. This means that you won't end up in this kind of situation, uh, like in this XKCD comic, where you try to fix problems that you created and so forth. Like uh, you, you, uh, you get you can build upon your learned information instead of like learning about habit and then keeping it on. Uh, so, so I would highly recommend like keeping a critical eye at your workflow. And I do this constantly myself. Like I often feel like this, like, you know, these infomercials where you have the black and white person who's like uh, in a black and white image is like, there got to be a better way. Like I often feel like that. And if you get that kind of a feeling that usually tells you that you're not using the correct tool. Like it's you yourself telling yourself that like something is wrong with this situation. And, and, and it's good to recognize that feeling because then you know that, okay, it's probably a good idea to, to at least not necessarily switch completely. If you are already halfway through your paper, paper and you want to get uh, stuff done, you cannot necessarily have the luxury of switching completely, but it might uh, be a good idea to like uh, uh, rec recognize this feeling. So, okay, but let's go to actual good examples. What, what so, uh, can I, uh, yeah. can I just ask you a question quick? Um, yes. So sure. about the tools, have you ever been in a situation where you, you change from the hammer to the, I don't know, the better tool, but your collaboration, your collaborators are not excited about, uh, they have to change to the better tool. 
uh well yeah yes like we have this software building environment like this is ongoing a hammer that is uh hammering nails that we have that i have built for us in internally and it's currently i think in this fifth iteration so it's been rebuilt at least about five times because like the the nails uh turned to screws and then you need a different tool and and it's unfortunate that many people usually often have to like look at then okay what has been changed how do you deal with it but at the same time that that is usually also a good idea when you have like a, you have something you have created and nobody else understands it but you you know that you also have a problem like if you have created something you have created a so complicated tool that you need to have like a big instruction manual to read it you also know that okay maybe i went overboard with this so yes uh, this this has happened to me multiple times and it's it's not something you can learn out of immediately but you can try and and usually uh, if you try to meet, like make it simpler, uh, like there's this saying, keep it simple, stupid. Like if you, if you try try to make it simpler and simpler, usually you end up towards like the correct solution. Uh, but of course, it, there, it's, there's no guarantee that you will ever uh, get something that is finished. But it's better to be uh, critical about your flaws than than like, and it's better to be done with something than than always try to aim for like perfect because then uh, you might end up also not doing anything <laughs> you, you still need to uh, get stuff done so it's this balancing act with between trying for perfection but falling and and uh, catching at least some some uh, some uh, nugget of gold okay but let's go through a few situations where you might what you might want to like do when you're doing scientific computing so first situation is like let's say you 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 uh, like you go to this journey of like small journey of explore, exploration maybe you have like a new data set or something like like something you don't know if it will work you don't know what happens and you want to like do some preliminary studies you want to check out a new maybe some new framework or new package or something does it work so what should you pack for this kind of how should you like start working on this kind of a project and these are completely arbitrary chosen by me but i i would say that the few things that really help a lot of our users is that they pick like a scientific programming language that can do like more than one thing um, they pick an editor or ide with some syntax highlighting and then they use uh, an interactive uh, IDE that allows you to write your like the ideas as scripts. So um, I'll quickly make this a bit bigger. So let's first go through the first point. So what are scientific programming languages? So I this is my definition, but I would say that scientific programming languages are languages that you can do some general stuff with but also you can do scientific calculations with so first off you want easy file input output because like if you ever write, written like in c or fortran you try to read data in or out uh, it's not fun it's not fun it's not you have lots of csv tables and it's it's not fun it's, it's not something you want to do like writing wrappers for like creating your input output you need a language that can do that that makes it a lot simpler like you don't have to start writing like printf statements and stuff like that uh, it should have some mathematical functions such as linear linear algebra cosine cosine typical stuff but also like integration and stuff like that like stuff you need um, easy plotting features so you don't have to go uh, above like you don't have to go around like and search for something uh, higher and and other things like this so what are options uh, you can look at the rest of the uh, things later but options that are nowadays more pop most popular are python which is like a, it's a general programming language but there's so many scientific pack packages and it's very popular the most popular currently but of course it probably won't stand uh, there for 
millennia, it, it, some, somebody will go and, and replace it eventually. But currently, it's the most popular language for scientific uh, computations. Then there's MATLAB, which is a commercial product. So that's a minus in my book immediately because you have to pay for it uh, or somebody has to pay for it. But at the same time, it already has a good idea in that it's easy to use. And in many fields, it's like in signal processing, it's, it's very popular. Uh, then there's Julia, which is uh, like an upcoming or new newcomer to the la to the competition, but it has the benefit that it's been designed from ground up to be a scientific computation language. So it's it's been designed to like be this kind of a language that you can use for scientific computation. So it's fast. It's designed for these kind of problems, but at the same time, it's newer. So there's you need to like uh, it's. Maybe for the pro may a bit more for the programming oriented, but if you feel like uh, it, it's it's a great language. Uh, and then there's R, which is very popular in bioinformatics, statistics, stuff like that. It's an old language, but at the same time, it has huge amount of different uh, packages for these uses, so it's very popular as well. And, and then there's like a bunch of, you can look at the list later on, but you can pick a pick from a, a bunch of good graphical editors and IDEs like, like this uh, development environments that have everything you need and pick one of them. Like I, I personally use non-graphical ones. I use Vim uh, or NeoVim actually, but, but like, it doesn't matter what I use everybody should use what they feel like is the best tool for them. Like choose one, one of the good, these are some of the popular ones. There might be a lot of missing. So uh, you can even point in the HackMD, which is your favorite. But the, it will help you a lot because you don't have to like, if you see, if you have an IDE or a editor that can provide you syntax highlighting that will tell you like, okay, I made a typo there. You don't like, that, that will already save you a lot of time debugging the code when, you, when you're writing. Uh, then another thing is that you want something that you can write as a script. Like you can, of course, type stuff into like interactive terminal in R or, or MATLAB or Python or Julia, but that's not something that will fly in long term. So it's better to start already writing a script. So because that will mean that you have like the whole story in one file like you have you start from the top and you read to the end and you the the uh, the whole adventure is gone through the whole uh, well it doesn't have to be the whole pipeline the whole workflow but some stuff is done throughout the script and and that means that you don't have this kind of an idea like well you have everything recorded there and you can run it as a whole and that is much better because like if you run some simple commands uh, one at a time, uh, you have this. You might have this situation where you next time you want to run these commands, you don't remember what commands you run. So it's better to write it as a script because then you don't have to remember. It's all written in the script, and that will help you. Uh, nowadays, also notebooks are very popular. So especially like in Python, but there's also other, like you can use notebooks in all kinds of um, places, but basically notebooks are this type of a document where you have this, these cells that contain code or documentation. And it's like one file, it contains both the code and the documentation and the script, and you can run it cell by cell. And it's, it's very easy to start using it and to do like quick data analysis. So these are something you might want to use for, like you just want to check if something works. But okay, what if you want to like graduate from this? Uh, like you want to start a project. You want to start a project. You don't know how, what kind of project is going to be, but you want to start a project that will uh, eventually produce something for you. Uh, what should you pack for that? What, what kind of things you should keep in mind when you start a project? Well, the number one thing is that use version control. So uh, like version control is amazing. Like if you <laughs> ever used it, because like, you don't have to anymore wonder, like, did I have the correct like source 
dot back back dot one dot something like you don't have to have these kinds of like incremental backups of your like version one dot something nothing like that you don't have to anymore like copy the whole source code folder to another and then you have a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy we, like that kind of structure say, should we say what that is version yeah what? that's yeah I'll, I'll go through uh, uh, yeah let's go i'll go through the rest of the points and then mm -hmm. uh, we can look into it uh, so th yeah th that's the first thing and ne ne next thing is that you should start documenting early because it's much easier to document early than later because you have less of stuff to do then <laughs> like if you constantly document then you don't have this kind of like okay i need to document everything now uh third thing is that you should keep track of what kind of requirements your process uh, your uh, project has and last you should um, uh, use existing packages so let's return to the version control uh, sorry if the talk is a bit goes uh, one way and goes another way but so version control uh, rather than ask a good question so how how would you describe actually how would you describe version control yeah we we save snapshots of the project as we go along i mean it can be code it can be i don't know scripts text we we save we record we record all the changes as we as we develop so that we can go back and that we can compare so how does version control manage these differences how does it recognize the difference between uh, if something has been changed so we can think of it as, as really recording like a snapshot at mm. at specific moments and then then it has a way to compare them Mm. Yeah, and and the comparison is 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 actually like line by line when it, when it comes to like text files. Uh, so these kind of version control systems they they can handle binary files as well. So let's say an image, but uh, usually they are handled when you have text. Let's say you have a uh, lines of text like this HackMD file over here. This is under version control as well. Like I've put it into Git. So so every line of text uh can be like stored and then whenever you add a line you can see that okay and now that line has changed and you can make a uh, uh you can add it to the version control so that okay now this is a new version uh and nowadays like the vastly the most popular version of control system is git like um uh, there are alternatives but git is the most popular but then people, some people would say, well, I'm not really programming. So is this something for me? Yeah, and, that's... And I would mm. say yes. Yes, yes. And why, why is that for them? I mean, they can, I think this is also if, if you want to record your workflow, mm. your yeah. uh, a reproducible workflow it doesn't have to be sort of programming, programming. Mm. And also that is really good to version. So that's yeah, share I, it I... with other people. I personally have like under version control my like um, like environment files that like if I need to like uh, use a different system I can just like get those from a Git repository. I have uh, my notes like if I make notes of of talks of 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 meetings. I mean I keep them under version control and stuff like that. Uh, I try to document as much as the like code I've written and. And keep that as a version control, like instructions how to use stuff. And and, and when and whenever I usually start a new project, if I know that it's going to be something, it's going to be something, I will put it under version control. Uh, of course, like if you have let's say a data set or something that is actually not changing, it's immutable, like it's only files. That's something that version control doesn't handle well. Well, it's mainly for like that those ideas that you write yourself. That is the main idea of version control. Of, of course, like some some data files can fit there as well, but but mainly for like your ideas, if you have written them, you want them to be able to be transferred easily. You want them to be like more. You you can keep the history of it. Control Z won't work if the if the computer <laughs> uh, computer crashes. So. Yes. And I think we have four minutes left, so let's okay. Not let's to let's yeah. Let's, essentials. So uh, commenting, documenting. Uh, I'll quickly note there's few tools that help you with it. Uh, so in version control, you have by the way like this amazing systems where you can post the stuff. Uh, you can read more in the documentation uh, here and good courses there as well. 
uh, but yeah commenting there's uh easy like the markdown which this hackmd document is markdown or common mark as it's known the standard uh it's easy to write like these documents uh use i would recommend trying to learn, learn how to use that it's very easy to write documentation uh then there's the uh if you want to like make your you don't want to like uh, you want to know how to comment properly you can look into some style guides from various organizations like how they suggest you write your comments so you don't have to think about yourself how do i formulate my comments that's basically like if you have a diary and it's pre-filled like fields you can like think of it uh, uh, like that like you just fill whatever you want in the pre-filled fields instead of like trying to start from a blank page uh, similarly, you have these linters that can automatically recognize, that, okay, there's a missing comment, put put a comment here. Like they can help you look through your code and keep it in check, the style in check. Uh, then uh, keeping track of requirements. So uh, you should write, it can be instructions, it can be a script, it can be whatever. You should have one some way of writing down what you have done to make this end of like this coding environment work. What does it need the system? Because often you end up in a situation where you're far from the starting point, and then if something breaks, you need to do it all over again, and you don't, or your collaborator needs to do it, and they don't know how to do it. So it's a good idea to keep uh, track of the requirements. Uh, but this is uh, like when it comes to starting a new project this is probably the most well they're, they're all the most important things but but this is one of the most important things is that uh use existing packages and frameworks so there, there's this quote by isaac newton that if i have seen further it is by standing on the shoulders of of giants and uh, it, it's been theorized that it, it's probably not as honest as it uh, the quote as it said here but but the idea is that uh, like if you start based like if you use already existing information you don't have to like recreate it and and basically there are lots of people who are doing the same thing as you are and if you have have this kind of feeling like like i mentioned like this uh, there has to be a better way usually somebody has the product and compared to like these infomercial products it's actually a working product like somebody has written somebody who's like i i I don't say that I understand everything about computing, but I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of people who are a lot better in, or, or there's a lot of organizations like Google or something that have a lot of money on the line that their products are good. And those people usually like, they provide uh, the code available to you and a lot of the frameworks for you. So why not use those instead of trying to cre create it your own? Like I know how, let's say, Newton's uh, Newton's method works, but I don't want to code it myself. <laughs> like I, I would rather use already existing packets that I know that it works. Uh, the the algorithm already works. It's a great point, and it's not only about reusing standard packages, but also standard way of setting up a project. We have a couple of questions on the chat on the mm -hmm. on the HackMD about like how to structure a project, and I think many people struggle with that and. And also there, I think, reach out to the community, reach out to your colleagues, Yeah, do what they do. Uh, I would recommend taking the code refinery lessons. There's excellent material on how to start a project. Uh, yeah. this, this last uh, topic, this is basically about that question. And it's, it's um, mainly like uh, this is very hand wavy, this last section. But I would, um, I would say that like for a lasting project, uh, you need to like work together with other people because you're going to be doing um, you're doing, going to be working with code that somebody else has created. You're going to be use, doing stuff that somebody else has to read at some point, uh, and especially if you need help with it. And uh, at some point, you need to publish research and stuff like that. So you need to make the code presentable. And when you're doing this. You, you're constantly working in an ecosystem with other people. So it's usually a good idea to involve them as much as possible throughout the whole project. And um, it, it doesn't mean that you need to like constantly badger them and, and poke them in the, in the shoulder, like, okay, what's your opinion on this? But mainly like uh, if you have a problem, 
ask other people. Like Radovan had a great talk on on how to ask people uh, if you have you know that you're going to be use a framework. Uh, check check what the community around the framework is talking about it. Like what kind of issues they have. Use that as a like a strength. Uh, check what other projects that you feel like you aspire to be. Like if you see a already existing like amazing machine learning model from let's say DeepMind or something. Like I often go to just to read DeepMind blog to see what what people in uh, in AI are doing, and not because I I would necessarily do it myself. The same thing, but to just to see what kind of things the people at the forefront of the science are doing, and and trying to gather like okay what kind of learnings would we gather from them it doesn't have to be that it's like uh like okay i need to be as good as like the team of engineers at google <laughs> like that's not possible necessarily and and you shouldn't put that kind of a burden for yourself but at the same time uh it's good idea to be like um, motivated by like nice things that you see around it and think that okay maybe i might try to do similar kinds of things and that's a great conclusion. So learning from other people. I think we are running slightly over time. We will take a break soon. But after the break, my understanding is that we will have a Q&A and panel discussion and there we can pick up some of these questions and some of these topics and discuss them more in detail. Yeah. yeah. So, so, thanks so much, that would be the perfect time for many of these practical things. We'll have a lot of people here and can see that there's not always one answer. <laughs>